So first of all, um, thanks very much to Peter for the kind introduction and to, to Wendy for inviting me and for the, the opportunity to speak at the Penn Humanities Forum. Um, I'm going to start off by showing you a deliberately broad and diverse set of visualizations of networks of varying kinds and then make some perhaps unifying comments about them. Um, this very beautiful and I think organic looking diagram um, is a famous one that was generated about circa 1999 at uh, the old Bell Labs Lucent Technologies. And it shows a visualization of the internet circa 1999 at the router level. So if you could see this in any detail, which I know that you can from where you're sitting, you'd see it's made up of tens of thousands of tiny little points, each one of them representing a physical computer known as a router, which essentially acts as the giant packet switches that form the backbone or infrastructure of the internet. And there's a little edge or a link or a line between two of those routers if there's some direct physical connection between them, like an ethernet or other um, fiber optic cable. Um, circa 1999, if you could see the little notation down there at the bottom, you'd see that the internet at that time consisted of roughly 100,000 routers. I think it's probably about an order of magnitude larger now. Um, and what's striking about this figure already is that even though much of the detail of it is obscure, first of all, if I'd been shown this without knowing what it was, I might guess it was an image from nature rather than from technology. And in particular, it's experienced, of course, as we all know, explosive growth over the last decade. And to drive that point home, I can't help but put up what I know to what I believe is the first visualization of the Internet, um, which is circa 1969, about 30 years earlier. Uh, this is a hand-drawn sketch from one of the founding members of the Internet project when it was then known as the ARPANET. And it consisted of about four or five routers connecting a few research universities in the United States and, of course, some Department of Defense um, labs as well. This next image, um, as we know, so as we know, the internet, um, what I just showed you really was a technological network. It's a physical network. You can kind of go out and lay your hands on this thing in reality physically if you wanted to. But of course, what's most interesting about the internet in many ways is that it supports many other more abstract virtual networks. Um, this is a very recently generated image that's actually showing, um, a it's a showing a visualization of connectivity between World Wide Web domains. So each little point or dot here is, you can think of it as a website or a collection of pages of an organization, a web domain, and there's basically a link between two domains here if there's sufficient amount of cross-reference between their web websites in the form of hyperlinks. Um, Furthermore, annotated in this diagram, there are light nodes and dark nodes. The dark nodes identify well-known spamming domains from which spam emanates in large volume. And so again, in this diagram, um, it's sort of thought-provoking to look at this and compare it to the last one. You start to see certain properties already in common, namely um, not all of the vertices or nodes are connected here, but there's a sort of what you might consider a giant component in the middle. And then you have these sort of very beautiful symmetric structures around the edge, which might be happenstance or they might be um, sort of deliberate collaborations between the organizations that are running those websites. Uh, now this is a, uh, also a very recent diagram. One of the fun things about, about teaching and doing research in this area is that I, I almost never have to use the same image from year to year in my class if I don't want to. Uh, this is what we would think of as a good old-fashioned traditional social network. It documents the romantic relationships between the students in a high school in Washington State. Of course, the blue nodes are the boys and the pink ones are the girls. And again, you have quite a bit of connectivity structure. You see that, um, that this doesn't show all of it. There were some isolated individuals and couples. Um, but of course, the most striking thing about it is the presence of this mysterious cyclical structure. And of course, you do again have these sort of super nodes or connectors as Peter was referring to. So this is a good old fashioned social network um, of the offline variety. I wouldn't have needed to make that distinction 10 years ago again. Um, this is a visualization that I actually participated in generating. This is um, again about 10 years ago, pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter, et cetera. This is a visualization of significant amounts of interactions between the individuals in a large internet chat environment. Um, and so again, you have very dense connectivity. You have certain individuals here with an extraordinary number of neighbors um, and all kinds of other substructure as well. Um, again, uh, another kind of network supported by the underlying technological uh, network of the internet. This is also a social network, but an even more abstract one that's really based on content. 
again, the individuals, or the individual nodes in this network are, are real people. This happens to be a visualization of relationships between the various figures involved in the Enron scandal of a few years ago. It has both organizations and individuals in it. Um, the central hub or connector here is the Enron Corporation itself and its chief financial officer, Andy Fastow. You see Dick Cheney and Scooter Libby over here also. Um, and the way, this, the way this particular diagram was generated was by taking a very large corpus of documents related to the scandal and declaring there to be a connection between two individuals if they co-occurred sufficiently frequently in that set of documents, okay? So um, again, the, the, the internet invites these kinds of studies, these kinds of visualizations, where you're taking something very abstract like a set of documents and then inferring social relationships from it. And of course, some of them may be inaccurate, um, but, but there, you wouldn't, the, the more you stare at these sorts of things, um, the more you can't help the feel that um, there was definitely something conspiratorial going on just from the network structure alone. Um, and of course, this isn't limited to machines or people. Um, the, the sort of advent of this field has made all kinds of people interesting in generating all kinds of visualizations. This is a vi visualization of the correlational structure between stocks um, listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Um, and this last example is, again, a very recent uh, visualization that was generated by a colleague of mine in um, the Brain and Cognitive Sciences Department at MIT, who's a leader in the field that's now becoming known as connectomics, which is attempting to study the very, very fine-grained connectivity structure of the human brain or other biological um, uh, systems. So what you have here is an image actually generated by taking incredibly thin slices or wafers of brain and then meticulously staining them so you can actually chart at the neuronal level patterns of connectivity. So you can see sort of big blobs that correspond to the cell bodies and the longer blobs correspond to the axons between them. And so for the first time, for whatever it's worth, there's quite a bit of debate about how much we will or won't learn about the brain from such documentation. But for the first time, it's actually possible with these imaging techniques to really go down and essentially reconstruct what you might think of as the circuit diagram, or at least portions of the circuit diagram of something as complicated as the human brain. So um, I deliberately showed these visualizations both because they're fun to look at um, but because of their diversity and breadth. And I want to talk about sort of um, several distinct but related revolutions, I think, that made this kind of study and this, this, this diversity and depth of study simultaneously possible. So, and, and I don't think I'm going to say anything here that, that's um, alarming or surprising to you, but I think it's important to think about it in the context of all of these different networks that can now be documented and studied. So, so one is that we've essentially gone, one revolution that's occurred in the last 10 or 20 years or so is essentially a revolution of instrumentation and measurement and the data that that instrumentation and measurement has produced. Now, much of this instrumentation and measurement has been enabled directly or indirectly by the internet, but not all of it, right? So connectomics, the, the process of studying the fine-grained structure of the brain um, didn't really rely on, on any internet technology. It really relied on advanced imaging and really mechanical processes for getting the slices as thin as possible. But many of the examples I gave, of course, were enabled in one way or the other by the internet. Now, it's not just the existence of the internet, of course. It's also our use of it, which I would call really a collective act of instrumentation. So we all know the, the you know, sort of mythology and I believe reality that, that many or all of us in one way or another are consenting to have ever more of our social activities and interactions with each other and with organizations documented and stored as data, which can then become available for different groups to study. And I mean, this talk is not about the pros and cons of that process, but I just want to observe that one fact about it is that it has made many of these network studies and visualizations possible in the first place. And then, of course, you have this incredibly rich data that, that comes out of these studies. And one of the things, of course, you can do with it is entirely descriptive, namely just show the network and kind of marvel at its structure and beauty. Um, <clears throat> Sort of commensurate with these revolutions, of course, has been a change in scale. It's not just that the Internet has enabled these things, but the scale of the Internet itself, both in terms of, let's say, the number of users of the Internet or the number of documents that are stored on the Internet, um, 
uh, has really gone from a very, very small scale on the orders of hundreds or thousands to the order of billions. And again, this same revolution of scale is happening because of various measurement advances in other fields as well. Um, and, you know, these, these revolutions together have really put us in a position now that I think we fundamentally weren't in about 10 years ago, which is it's really reasonable now to think about many, many different types of networks simultaneously and ask the, I think, the question whose, whose answer a priori is not obvious, which is whether there's anything possibly to learn from studying very, very diverse networks in some sort of common framework, okay? And, um, of course, the field that, that studies this, which is becoming known as network science, which I, I have mixed feelings about because, um, as with computer science, I feel like any field that needs, feels the need to append the word science to the end of it um, doth protest too loudly, if you know what I mean. But, um, but, but yeah, I've started taking the quotes off this because I think, you know, it, it, they're, they're, it's, it's too far now to, to turn back. Um, but, but, but the, the field I'm going to really give you a very whirlwind tour of today, of course, didn't start by saying, hey, I wonder if there's something to be gained by comparing all of these diverse networks simultaneously. It really formed in a bottom-up fashion by people in these individual fields, biologists studying biolog biological network, sociologists studying sociological network, computer scientists studying technological networks. They were all kind of doing this already as part of their normal business and then started realizing that there was an opportunity to kind of compare structure, for instance, and compare functionality, and compare robustness or vulnerability across many, many different fields. And so even though I'm not here to propose, nor few people that I know would propose, that there is um, much in common, for instance, with the way um, organizations decide to add routers and connect them to the internet and let's say the way the human brain grows during development by adding neurons and axons. Nevertheless, we can acknowledge the radically different formation processes that might have gone into them and ask, is there a common structure or other, prop or other properties in common? And if there are, how, how might we explain them? And that's basically what the field of network science um, aims to do. Now, um, one other reason why I started with that diverse set of images is to kind of um, force you to think about the challenge that the agenda that I just laid out presents. Because, of course, every one of these networks, I like to say to my class, they're, you know, they're all like snowflakes. Every one of them is, of course, radically different in its details from any other one, right? There's no sense in, you know, taking a, a circuit diagram of some small part of the human brain and a map of the of internet router connectivity and hope that you're going to sort of say, well, this neuron corresponds to that router and this edge corresponds to, to that axon. Um, so one of the, you know, so, so really this is a field that's trying to compare snowflakes. And if you're going to compare snowflakes, you, of course, have to blur your eyes somehow. Um, and, of course, the, the hard thing to do is to be tasteful about that blurring by tasteful, I mean doing enough blurring that you might actually find meaningful common structure, and on the other hand, not blur so much that you sort of obscure all of the interesting details of the, of the constituent or individual networks of interest. So um, what I'm going to spend a couple of slides telling you about is the part of network science that I think is the most developed and mature at this point, which has really, uh, I think, been hinted at both in, in Peter's introduction and what I've said so far, um, this idea that very, very diverse networks from radically different domains that developed under radically different processes possibly sharing common structure in a quantifiable way, sort of what I might call topological universals of naturally occurring networks. And that's a fairly mature branch of the field. Of course, it's very, very active, and as you'll see, there are many, many, many weaknesses to it and things to complain about it, but it's relatively well populated at this point. Um, and it's also what I would call entirely descriptive. You basically are documenting the shapes of networks and what sort of common features they seem to have across many different networks. Um, and if one convinces oneself that there's enough of that common structure, that the same sorts of shapes or substructures seem to arise in the brain and in social networks and in technological networks, so on and so forth, um, you know, a good scientist doesn't want to stop by just marveling at that consistency. You'd like to explain it somehow, right? So you'd like to move from the descriptive to the prescriptive. 
And one way of doing that is with models, right? To essentially suggest mathematical models that, that are ideally as simple as possible in some sense that could explain how rather these, the same structure could arise in a, in a wide variety of formation processes, okay? So let me just spend a, um, a few minutes talking about um, a couple of those um, sort of structural properties that have been documented, um, and then I'll show you some web demos that um, kind of simulate models that are meant to uh, reproduce those particular properties. And, and two of them have actually conveniently already been mentioned by Peter, and I think many of you might be familiar with them from you know, um, either reading technical or popular writings, in, including things like The Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, for instance, which was the subject of the Penn Reading Project a few years ago. So, so one, of, one notion, of course, is this idea, the, this mythology of six degrees of separation, this idea that um, it's alarmingly common in very, very large networks, not just social networks, but in technological networks, biological networks, so on and so forth, that what in mathematical ter terms we would call the diameter of the network is quite small. Diameter basically being some sort of measure of the average shortest path distance between a typical pair of nodes in the network, okay? And so, as many of you may know, the, the, the phrase six degrees of separation really arose from this famous, very visionary, very controversial 1969 social science experiment involving chain letters by Travers and Milgram, um, who were social psychologists. Um, and you know, one of just to give you a little sense of, of of how one goes down this field and taking an anecdote like that and turning it into something a little more general and measurable. You know, obviously, if we want to talk about the diameter of a network being small i.e. the notion that most pairs of individuals are pretty close to each other in the network, we can't use as our definition of small six, right? Because six, you know, maybe was appropriate for the United States population back in 1969, but almost certainly it's not now. Somehow small should be related to the overall population size of the network, right? So having an average distance of six if the network is only, let's say, 100 nodes large, if the population size is only 100, is not nearly as impressive as if it's, say, a billion, okay? So you have to figure out some way of quantifying what you mean by small. And one way, of course, of doing that is to say that small means much, much smaller than the population size. Let's say some very, very slowly growing function of the population size, like a, a logarithmic function or something even growing more slowly. Um, but so this is a structural universal that's very, very often observed in naturally occurring networks. Another one is this notion of connectors and more generally the idea that the degree distribution, as they call it in network science, namely if you take a very, very large network and you plot a histogram where on the x-axis you, you, you measure how many neighbors an individual has in the network, how many immediate one-step neighbors an individual has in the network, and the y-axis measures how many individuals in the network have that number of neighbors. Um, it's what you, it's what's often called a heavy tail distribution, meaning that um, it doesn't look sort of like a nice sharply peaked bell curve, but rather has this very, very fat tail, one consequence of which is the perpetual reliable appearance of these super connector individuals. And again, you have to sort of say, what do you mean by that? I can't define that by saying, well, um, the super connector is somebody with 100 connections because that's just appropriate for some networks and not for others. And so the way you would typically quantify that is to say something like, well, heavy tail would mean that the maximum number of neighbors that somebody has in the network is many, many orders of magnitude larger than the average number of neighbors, okay? And just to sort of illustrate that, that these things really do reliably occur as sort of part of an exercise in my class a couple of years ago, uh, a couple of enterprising students who were good programmers went above and beyond the call of duty and wrote a little script to actually spider the Facebook network within the Penn community and basically count how many Facebook friends each person in the Penn community had. And this is what that histogram looks like, right? So you, um, you I know you can't read the numbers here, but it starts down at, at one, right? There, there's, these are the people with only one Facebook friend and it goes from there. And you know the, the data here is that the average number of Facebook friends for a Penn student circa a couple of years ago was about 270. Um, and the max was over 4,000, okay? 
Now, of course, you can ask, what are these people doing? But that's that's not that's not the the, the purpose of this lecture. The point is, is that um, I'm, I'm claiming to you without proof that there's a large literature that goes out and again and again for radically different kinds of networks, essentially produces something like this plot and observes this same phenomenon. Okay, and you know, and then the further claim is, is that if you think about it a little bit, that phenomenon needs some sort of explanation. It's not a trivial thing to explain why that same structural property should arise so regularly. I'll describe one um, explanation for that shortly. Um, another very common is what is, and look at the network from a bird's eye view, and you look at the arrangement of connections in the network. It doesn't look random. It doesn't look like it was thrown down without pattern. They tend to be clumped together. So one way of saying this is that if you're friends with A and friends with B, then A and B are much more likely to be friends with each other than two individuals chosen at random from the background population. Right? So where there are edges locally, there tend to be more edges. Okay? And again, this is something that's not trivially explained. Okay? You have to sort of think why this might happen. And again, just to talk about the goals of this field a little bit, um, there are, you know, for any given domain, let's say technological networks or the internet more specifically, there might be very, very good, rather specific reasons one can identify why such structures would occur. Okay? You might say things like, well, it's just sensible to have these hub routers with a lot of connectivity because like our air traffic system, or maybe this is a bad example, it's an efficient way of trying to route messages between different different nodes in the network. And so, um, and, and that, that, that specific explanation is almost certainly better than the general explanations that this field would give applied to that particular situation. But the goal, again, is to try to identify general principles that even if blurry, might contain a seed of truth across many, many, many different domains and networks, okay? So let me um, switch. We had some connectivity difficulties here before, but I'm going to switch. To a couple of demos. Now, um, there, there's sort of a, uh, a saying in computer science that goes along the lines of like, never do live demos in a talk, right? It'll always work against you. And, and there are the, the, the number of, 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 of documentations of, of sort of colossal failures are, are many fold, like, you know, um, Bill Gates um, introducing a new Microsoft service at a large trade show that, that, in, that just gagged and gave you the blue screen of death, et cetera. Um, but but I'm, I'm a bold guy, so I'm going to go ahead and do it. So, so um, and one of, again, one of the nice things about this field is that it's so active and it's so um, visually appealing that for a lot of the ideas and models that people have proposed, somebody's gone out and written a nice web demo of the idea. So what I'm going to show you here is the most brain-dead model you could possibly imagine for network formation, in which you just sort of start with some population of individuals represented by the dots on this ring, and you just start adding edges to the network. So at the beginning, nobody's connected to anybody else, and at each time step, you just pick two individuals at random that are not already connected to each other and connect those two, okay? And so the question is, is if I, if I start, if I run this process on, let's say, a large population, and look at the growth pattern and the structural properties that emerge, and you think about those three properties I mentioned on the last slide, namely the network having a small diameter, and the network having these connectors, and there being edge clustering, you can, I'll leave it as an exercise to the listener to think about which, if any, of those three properties would be entailed by such a model. Um, to make things interesting, I'll crank up the population size here to a whopping 250 or so. And um, let just this thing start doing its stuff. Let me slow it down a bit. Okay. And the purpose of this particular demo, although there's, I'll say more about it, is actually to track the growth of the so-called largest component. So, you know, at the beginning, the network is highly fragmented, and you know, most vertices aren't connected to anything. And what the red highlighting is doing is it's always showing you that set of individuals that are in the largest single connected component, meaning there's a path between all of them, okay? And one of the claims of the field and one of the phenomena of this model is that um, even when the number of edges in the network is very, very small, meaning that on average, each individual might only have one neighbor, this component is gonna get very, very big. 
And in fact, that's what's being plotted over here. You see that this is showing the number of connections per node in the network, and here's a line at one. So we've just crossed the point where on average, everybody has about one neighbor, even though some have more and some have less. And you can already see that in this very simple model, we're already reproducing this phenomenon of a very, very large number of the vertices being in a single connected component. And furthermore, I'll claim without proof that if I let this run just a little while longer to the point where everybody has, say, two or three vertices or connections per node, um, then there will be just a single component here. And furthermore, the diameter will be quite small. So if our goal, for instance, was to explain how networks could, very, very large networks could come to have very, very small diameter, even when the number of connections in the network is extremely sparse, this model gives a very good explanation for it. Now, of course, one of the things you might and maybe you should be thinking is like, well, but this is ridiculous. Um, you know, what network actually forms in such a stochastic, unbiased fashion with just individual pairs of individuals randomly linking with each other? Um, and that's a legitimate criticism of it. I'll also argue that in some ways it's a merit of this model as well. Okay, but this, this goes on as you can see. Now, a slightly more interesting model is one that's known as preferential attachment. Um, and this is sometimes called a, a, an instance of the phenomenon generally known as a, a rich get richer or Matthew effect. So this model is a little bit more interesting. It's also a, a randomized or stochastic model. Um, and rather than starting with sort of all of the vertices arranged and then gradually picking pairs to connect, this model starts with just two vertices connected by a single edge. And then at each round, it's going to add one more individual to this network. And it's going to give that individual one connection back to the existing network. Okay? So there's going to be, at each given moment, there's going to be a single component of connected vertices or nodes. And there's going to be one new node added. And that one newly born node is going to get one edge back to the rest of the network. But that, net, that edge will not be chosen randomly. It'll be chosen according to a process where the probability it connects back to an existing node is proportional to the current degree of that node. So in plain English, this is a model where the more friends you have, the more likely you are to receive new friends. Okay? So if I have you know, twice as many friends as you, then I'm twice as likely to get any new inbound connections. And this is, again, a very, very crude model but again, you, when you project it onto individual domains, let's say, like, for instance, business or economic networks, there's often some aspect of this model present, right? So in particular, if you're a company selling widgets and you have competitors who are also selling widgets, but you're the biggest widget seller, it's not just that you're the biggest wi widget seller, which you are. There's always somebody who's biggest. But you're advantaged in being bigger in your rate of growth as well. Okay? And you can imagine many reasons for this. The more business you have, the more customers you might have that recommend your service or product to others. And, and so there's actually an accelerative process going on. And so let me run this one. Okay? And so this is going at a fairly high speed. Um, but you can see that you can see pretty quickly that one of the consequences of this model, and I assure you if I did this for you five more times, you'd be convinced that this was not an artifact of this particular randomized run of the simulation. You can see these supernodes starting to emerge, these individuals whose number of connections is much, much larger than the average. And in fact, that same histogram is basically being dynamically plotted over here. Here you have the number of neighbors on one axis. Here's how many vertices or nodes have that neighbor. You can see the vast majority have one, two, maybe three connections. The max right now is 48 and growing. And this can be highlighted in this demo nicely by clicking on this button, which makes the size of a node proportional to its degree. And so you can see there's not just one of them, but they're a small fraction of the population. Maybe there's half a dozen of these super connector nodes, including one that seems to be gaining in dominance as time goes on. OK? OK. Um, so, so this is a sense for this sort of structural side of network science. Um, and I think where a lot of the most interesting action right now is in relating network structure to dynamics. So in other words, there's something very, very unsatisfying about just going around and documenting structural properties within networks, even if they are frequently occurring. You sort of want to ask, how does it, how does it matter? Does it matter at all? Maybe it doesn't. 
maybe these super connectors sort of always appear but play no special role in an organization or a network, um, and how would we know? So a lot of the interesting or a lot of the most, um, one of the most active frontiers of research in this area is in trying to relate the structure, what we know about the structure of networks to dynamics or, or um, more basically what's happening on the network. Okay, so, you know, the kinds of questions we want to ask is like, well, so you have connectors in this network. Is that helpful or harmful with respect to whatever goal, if there is such a thing, that's trying to be accomplished by the network? And some of you may, of course, have seen you know, studies that say, well, on the one hand, these connectors are acting as the hubs of communication, but on the other hand, they introduce vulnerabilities because if they go down, for instance, then, then many, much of the network might become disconnected. Now, a lot of the research that's gone on in this area is, has been restricted until recently to what I might call the dynamics of transmission. So by that, I mean um, um, where what's going on in the network is something is basically being passed around. Okay, and where what's being passed around might be a message, it might be a disease, it might be an idea. So this metaphor of contagion that's discussed at great length um, and, and perhaps oversold a bit in the tipping point is in reality a dominant metaphor in the scientific literature on the dynamics of network and how they relate to structure. And we know a fair amount now about how for that particular class of dynamics, um, we, we, how the structure and the dynamics itself interacts, and how, in particular, the local behaviors of transmission lead to collective outcomes. Now, I'm going to do something else that I do in my undergraduate class frequently, which is to just get you thinking a little bit about network structure and, um, and dynamics and how they might interact with each other. Um, we're going to do a little uh, in-lecture participatory demo which, for which I brought a low-tech uh, uh, prop. So um, what I'm going to do is something not unlike what I do in the experiments in my group that I'll describe to you shortly, um, which is I'm going to exogenously impose a social network structure on all of you sitting here right now. So let me define that network structure. Listen carefully. You'll, you'll, you'll need to be able to identify who your neighbors in this network are. So there's going to be three different categories of link in this network. So you're connected to anybody that you can pass the tennis ball to without leaving your seat, okay? And so this is what I might think of as a crude proxy for local geographic connectivity, right? And, and even though it's very artificial, there might actually be some vestige of reality in it in that probably many of you came in together in groups and are likely to be sitting next to or near to people you know, okay? But that's just a local network, okay? And now I'm gonna add some what I might call long distance connections to this network. So you're also connected to anybody that shares your birthplace, where by birthplace, let's say, it's either the state you were born in if you were born in the United States, or it's the country you were born in if not. Okay, so that's another set of neighbors that you have. And um, let me just throw in one more to make things interesting. Um, you get to pick your favorite hobby, and anybody that shares that favorite hobby is also a neighbor of yours, okay? Everybody understand the network structure, the, the network structure I'm imposing on you? Now, right now, None of you really know what that network structure looks like, except, of course, the first category of people you can pass the ball to without moving. And what I want to do now is have Peter here take this tennis ball, and I'm going to lead you through a process where your collective goal is to move that tennis ball from Peter to, let's say, that fellow sitting in the back right corner of the room. Could you just raise your hand for us? Okay. So here's the source individual. That's the target individual. And we're really studying the same problem that Travers and Milgram did their chain mail experiment on in 1969. And the question is whether this, this and so you'll, you'll see now, I mean, this is much more dangerous than doing a technological demo. Um, so this is why I'm emboldened to do things like web demos. Um, so, so what I want you to do, Peter, is stand up and um, let's have you state your birthplace. Okay, everybody born in New York, please stand up. Okay, and what's your favorite hobby? Uh, travel. travel. Okay, so now you can, your goal is to get it to that guy and you can throw it to anybody you want to. <laughs> but. Not somebody I speak about. No, 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 so it's, it's the union of these three choices. So in this particular case, I won't make you do it because it's a long throw. But in this particular case, you're one hop away, okay? So let's, let's try it a second time, with, starting with Wendy. Okay, so Wendy, birthplace? Where? 
Canada and favorite hobby? Okay, so everybody who was born in Canada or has a favorite hobby of music stand up. Okay, so you're now free to pass it to either somebody you can reach from your seat or to one of the people standing up, again with the goal to get to the same guy in the back right corner. I actually want you to throw it, yeah. That's part of the fun. That's, that's part of the fun for me. Okay. So now if you could stand up, okay, and tell us. So now the reason I gave two choices here is to make sure that you have some long-distance connections different than Wendy did, or, or there's a chance of it. So what's your birthplace? Okay, so Japan and music are your, are your okay, so everybody from Japan, or with a favorite hobby of music, please stand up. Okay, and now you can choose who to throw it to or pass it to. Okay, birthplace and everybody sit down except you. Birthplace and, okay, and, and um, hobby was music. Was calm. Okay, so now you can throw it to one of those people or to one of the people sitting near you. Okay, uh, birthplace and hobby. Okay. Okay. Connecticut and woodworking. Um, I'm going to ask to see samples of your woodworking later. <laughs> Find that just a little too cute. Okay. Okay. Anyway, so so. Um, so this is sort of how this, this demo usually goes. Sometimes there's a very, very short path and it's very easy to find. And sometimes actually it takes a fair bit of wandering. And I've actually done it on similar audiences where, you know, after five or 10 minutes, we just had to give up. Now, so, so the, it, the one important distinction I think that's worth making here that makes this problem a challenging and interesting one to study as well as a realistic one is that there's a big difference between claiming that a network simply has short paths connecting pairs of individuals and it's a second and stronger thing to claim that the individuals in that network, as in the simulation we just did, with only local knowledge of the network, no bird's eye view, can actually find those short paths, okay? And the Milgram experiment kind of conflated those two things, and more recent studies have tried to separate them. But, but in, what I'm trying to drive home here is the fact that it's not just the structural properties of the network, which is kind of a bird's eye statement. It's that these networks that we're interested in often consist of sort of autonomous individuals who don't have the luxury of knowing the global structure. They may only know their immediate neighbors, as in what we did right now. And even though these structures, for instance, short paths might exist, it might be very, very difficult to exploit them in a distributed fashion from only local information. Okay? So let me just spend a little time now telling you about um, this, this leads kind of nicely to the, the work that I do in my group here at Penn. And in particular, the work I'm going to tell you about is a series of, of really very controlled, highly styled, deliberately stylized and highly controlled laboratory experiments on collective problem solving and strategic behavior in network settings from only local information. And really, these experiments started, um, the genesis of them was really in my undergraduate class when I was trying to illustrate ideas from the network science literature with little in-class games like we just played here. And the outcomes were frequently thought-provoking and interesting enough that I thought, well, we should really try to do this in a very controlled way scientifically and see what we can find. So let me give a high-level description of what we do. So we run controlled behavioral experiments where we bring roughly three dozen subjects into a lab full of workstations at a time simultaneously. And for those of you who've ever run human subject experiments, um, you can probably appreciate just the subject management challenges of getting 36 undergraduates to commit to showing up reliably for three hours. And so of course I overpay and I pay for backups, so on and so forth. Sorry, did some. <laughs> No, they, 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 I give them enough cash that they can go uh, 
uh, buy top shelf liquor if they want to. Um, but, but so they, I bring several dozen subjects in at a time. Each one is at a workstation. Um, the subject, the, the, the uh, experiments are highly controlled, and I'll show you a screenshot of a typical interface in a second. You're basically just controlling some simple property of your node in some exogenously imposed network um, that nobody in the room is aware of. It, you only have a local view of your neighborhood in the network. Um, and so um, advantages of these experiments are that we're, we, we know and we've chosen the network structure. We know and we've chosen the incentives. We, we incent people according to their actual performance in the games. And as you can, you'll be able to gather from the images I'll show you, we get very, very fine-grained data that's incredibly rich as well. And we get subject surveys, and we can explore counterfactual questions like, if you take this network and remove the connectors, does that degrade performance for this particular task or that particular task? So let me give you a flavor of the kinds of experiments we do. If you were a subject in our, an experiment, you might see a typical interface like this. There's sort of a central panel where we're showing you a small fragment of some global network. So you're in a network that, um, in which you're connected, perhaps indirectly, to all the other three dozen participants in the experiment. We sort of clearly identify your node in the middle here, marked as you. And we're basically showing you both your, your connections, your direct connections to your neighbors, and we're also showing you the connections between your neighbors. This is what sociologists sometimes refer to as the ego network because it's you know, centered on you and your friends and the connections between them. Okay? And in a typical game, um, you might only be, in fact, we've, we've done many kinds of experiments, but in all the ones I'll talk about today, um, the only thing you need to do at each moment in time in the experiment is to pick a color for your vertex. And whenever you pick a color for your vertex, whenever you change it by clicking on one of the color buttons down here, the color of your vertex will instantaneously change on your screen. And that will, of course, be seen instantaneously by any of your neighbors, but by nobody else. Okay. So if you were sitting here, you could change your vertex, and you might see the vertices of your neighbors changing as they make decisions. It's, anybody can update their vertex asynchronously anytime they want to, as often as they want to, and so on and so forth. And in this framework, we've been studying a series of sort of strategic experiments in which um, they all have this same format, and they're all tantalizingly close to each other, yet they're starkly different in sort of the strategic tensions that they introduce between the population and the network, and also according to various theories of the difficulty of computational problems, they have starkly different um, contrasts, okay? So in particular, um, this particular interface is from the so-called um, network coloring game. In the network coloring game, you can think of it as a model of social differentiation. You have three choices that you can choose of colors, and your goal, basically, you get paid in the experiment if you're a different color than all of your neighbors, okay? So in this particular case, at this particular moment, this subject is fine because they're the only yellow vertex in their neighborhood, um, and the others are green and red. So some of you may know, for instance, the famous four-color theorem, which this is related to. This is really a social science experiment asking the question whether a moderately sized population of subjects, given such a network, from only local information, can, can quickly, let's say within a minute or two, come up with a global solution. Okay? And we, we, I won't go into detail, but we also play around with the incentives, right? Sometimes we'll pay subjects if the, exper if the experiment ends and they're a different color than their neighbor, then they get paid, and, and regardless of whether there might be conflicts elsewhere in the network. And in other experiments, we insist on a global solution. So even though you might be a different color than all of your neighbors, if there's an edge somewhere else that has the same color on both ends, everybody gets nothing. Okay. So this is the spirit of the, the type of experiment we're doing. Um, in the first round of experiments we did, this was literally a visual, this is literally a visualization of the six networks that we gave to the subjects, um, with each one repeated under various other conditions that I, I won't go into. But, but I'm going to uh, show you just a couple of home movies of these things to um, kind of get you to appreciate, despite the simplicity and stylization of these experiments, the richness of behavior that can emerge. And I also invite you to look at those diagrams and think, well, which of these should be easier or harder than the, for the subjects? So this is a case where um, 
It's a simple cycle on 36 vertices. And so two colors suffice, right? There's, there's, if, if I showed this to you and I, I asked you to solve it on pencil and paper, nothing could be easier. You just go around red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green. But nobody knows that this cycle is present. All the, everybody's experience simultaneously is that they're a vertex and they have two neighbors. And they don't even know about an orientation of clockwise and counterclockwise, okay? So it turns out that this particular kind of network is actually extremely difficult for human subjects to solve. And this is showing you, um, slightly sped up, an actual movie of the color choices in sequence made by the participants in one of the runs of this experiment. And what you see is pretty quickly you get down to few conflicts. The orange, the, when, a, when a, an edge is, is black, it's supposed to be easier to see than the orange. That means that there's a conflict, right? So there, there's two... Uh, green vertices and now things shift and there's two greens there, so on and so forth. And what's nice about such a simple model is there's almost a mathematical inevitability about what has to happen in order to solve the collective problem. Each one of these conflict edges has to sort of migrate and find uh, an opposing one that can then be resolved by the player in the middle to sort of cancel the two particles out, okay? Um, but nobody knows about the structure of the network and only has local information. And you can see them kind of struggling with it. You can see that there's often sort of uh, sort of locally purposeful attempts to propagate an edge, in, you know, sort of from the incoming to the outgoing edge. But since there's no coordination, it's an extremely difficult problem. And this is easiest to see if I kind of grab this bar and move it back and forth, where you can really see that locally um, – there's an attempt to do some coordination, but there's just not quite enough global communication and, and coordination to solve the problem. And in this particular case, this experiment lasted um, five minutes before, we, before the, you know, the system time. Where we have to, at some point, we have to stop so that we get repeated trials. Otherwise, we might give them this, and they'd be sitting there trying to do this for three hours, which might well have happened. So, you know, on the one hand, we have this incredibly simple network, which subjects find very difficult. This is a network generated according to the um, preferential attachment process I showed you before and, you know, is a much nastier looking beast in many ways. And this is the same set of subjects attempting to find a solution here. Here, four colors are necessary, right? That's not obvious at all. But it's possible with only four, despite the fact that there are these individuals with extraordinarily high degree, as I've noted, there is some way with only four colors of finding a solution in which everybody's a different color than their neighbors, and that's why we gave them exactly four colors. And here, sort of, the dynamics need to be quite different in order to solve the problem. What really happens in this network, and here they're about to solve it as soon as uh, that edge gets resolved there. Um, what tends to happen here is that as soon as the game starts, these connector nodes wake up with a very hard problem because they have, let's say, 17 neighbors, and those 17 neighbors, by chance, have used up all four of the colors, okay? So this, this, con this connector, in this particular case, has a very difficult problem because they have no choice to, but to conflict with some set of their neighbors. And so their behavior tends to be to pick a color and try to remain stable and hope that their neighbors make the conflicts go away or propagate them elsewhere in the network. And if that doesn't work after a while, the super connectors will switch to one of the other colors and thereby shift the problem to a whole other set of people and hope that they can resolve it. But people tend to be... Um, tend, in, you know, in our experiments, people tended to do better on this kind of network than, it, than at least the extreme simple cycle. And, you know, when you added more long-distance connections on the cycle, as in, let's say, this network, you ease this problem greatly by introducing some long-distance communication that, you know, in physics terms just allows symmetry to be broken, so to speak. Okay? Now, um, if you're a computer scientist, you would know that graph coloring is a notoriously intractable problem from a computational perspective. So there's sort of a, a precise, formal, mathematical theory of algorithms that claims that this, the graph coloring problem, in, in a technical sense that I won't bother documenting, um, is, is really among the hardest types of optimization problems we know. So in particular, the best, the best general algorithm for finding the optimal number of colors needed, the fewest number of colors needed, I mean, if I give you enough colors, it's always easy, right? If I give you as many colors as there are nodes in the network, you just give everybody a different color. So the hard problem here is minimizing that number of, think of the colors as a resource. The hard problem is minimizing that number of colors. So from a computer science perspective, 
nothing could be harder than this problem of social differentiation, as you might call it, on a network. Um, and in contrast, the problem of consensus um, is it could, nothing could be more trivial. So consensus, think of it the sort of the exact same interface, but now the problem is to pick the same color as all of your neighbors rather than a different one. So it's a problem of social agreement rather than a social consensus. And so you can ask the question, well, what, what kinds of networks should be harder or easier for coloring versus consensus? And what role do super connectors play? Is it helpful or harmful depending on the problem? And this is the kind of thing we study in my group. This was a set of experiments run on a very different kind of network. Um, think of networks that basically start off with this shape, where you essentially have these tribal substructures. So here we have our six groups of size six each. And with each one of those groups of size six, we have full connectivity, a, a so-called cleat. Okay? And then to make the whole thing connected, I've sort of elected a representative from each one of these tribes and loosely connected them in some chain of communication. And on that particular network, and vary, so you can start with this network, and then you can vary this network by um, you know, picking some fraction of these internal clique edges and replacing them with just random long distance connectivity. Right? So you create a family of models that takes you from this highly um, tribal structure to something where the tribal structure essentially disappears, and you have something like the random network model that I started off with in that first simulation. Okay? Now, um, what I'm showing you here for your amusement are visualizations of the actual play of subjects in, uh, um, in networks that are basically very close to this tribal extreme. So the networks in each one of these visualizations, the, the underlying network in the experiment was either this literal network or this network with a few of these internal edges replaced with random long distance connectivity. And what I'm showing you here in each one of these experiments um, by the way, my standard joke about these figures is that if this line of research ever dies, I'm hoping for an alternative career as a postmodern artist. Um, but what I'm showing you in these figures is um, time in the game is going across the x-axis here. There are 36 rows here. Each row corresponds to the one, of the one of the 36 players in the network. And I'm just literally showing you what this player's color choice was at each moment in time in this experiment. And I've, of course, deliberately arranged the rows so that the first six rows correspond to this six group, group of six, the next six rows corresponds to this group of six, so on and so forth, mirroring the tribal structure of the network. Okay? And so what I like about these diagrams is that they show you how these experiments can evoke fascinating both collective and individual behavior simultaneously. And in these visualizations, you can see both of them clearly. So in a typical experiment, you know, you see, for instance, you know, we, they, by the way, they were given a choice of nine possible colors. So at the beginning, there's quite a diversity of color choice. And then quickly, the network settles down to two or maybe three colors. In this particular case, this yellow, brown, and, and red were present for the first third of the experiment or so. And then it basically comes down to a battle of red versus, um, I mean, of yellow versus orange. And this particular experiment ended, um, it actually ended successfully within a one minute period. It ends just when this last orange guy turns to yellow and we have global consensus, okay? And you can see most of them have this dynamic of reduction to a small battle between a few colors. But there are sort of fascinating instances of collective and individual behavior. So first of all, um, uh, you have acts of signaling here. So you, in general, the, this, is, this tends to be produced by people who have a connection to one of the other cliques. So this is probably somebody who was in a clique that was largely brown, who was connected to somebody in this a neighboring clique and was basically trying to signal or can, he could see the conflict, right? He could see that all his neighbors were brown, but that there's some other part of the network that's currently blue and is trying to experiment or signal to his neighbors that they should try changing to that color. Um, you see, you know, incredible acts of stubbornness, um, you know, who is, who, is, who is this cowboy here who, um, you know, risking everybody's payoff sits on blue despite the fact that there's nobody else in the network who's blue. So, you know, again, even though we're putting people into a very stylized experimental setting, personality still shows through. All the messy vicissitudes of human behavior um, come through. In terms of collective behavior, my favorite diagram is this one. So let me just kind of give you the play-by-play -play here. So pretty quickly, we get down to this sort of lime green, this blue, and this orange. Um, this is probably the same guy from that previous experiment again, um, a real troublemaker. 
and you can see that, that um, pretty quickly orange takes over a ma majority, and this lime green persists in, this, in one of the cliques. And it, but at some point, they give it up and switch over to blue. But not just before they manage to kind of influence neighboring vertices enough that there's sort of a, a very brief trickle of green to some very distant part of the network, which then actually takes a strong foothold. And you actually have a complete reversal between a large fraction of the population between green and blue. And then the green grows, the blue grows, and the green grows back. Out of 18 experiments of this type, this was the only one that didn't finish in one minute. And you can see where at the end of that minute, it's still basically a battle 50-50 between these, these two colors. A slight variant of this that we ran um, in the spring of last year was what we colloquially called the di Democratic primary game, because it was inspired by the um, Obama-Clinton campaign, by which I mean um, we were deliberately trying to introduce into a stylized game theoretic experimental setting the twin tensions that seemed very present in that primary, which is on the one hand, um, you know, everybody acknowledged that it was a very close race and that, of course, since individual voters have, might have strong preferences one way or the other, nobody should be forced out of the race and we should sort of see the thing through in order to figure out who the underlying majority preference actually was among Democrats. But then there was also this hand wringing going on, as you might remember, as it dragged into the spring and people said, well, this is taking too long. Meanwhile, the Republicans and McCain are building out their national campaign infrastructure. And so the general feeling from many editorials and articles at the time was like, well, we want to do this fairly and properly, but it's, we need to wrap this up soon. And as soon as we wrap it up, all good Democrats should rally around the winning candidate, um, even though it was a very bitter, or closely fought race, in order to then prepare for the national campaign. So we ran some experiments with different network structures that were just like consensus. Um, you're trying, the goal is for everybody to agree on a color. So in particular in these experiments, if at the end of a minute the entire network wasn't red or the entire network wasn't blue, everybody got nothing. If there were 35 reds and one blue, everybody got nothing for that experiment. So on the one hand, there was a strong force towards consensus. On the other hand, unlike the earlier consensus experiments, we gave differing incentives for each of the two colors. So different players in the same experiment might have higher payoffs for red or blue. So I might, for instance, be told at the beginning of the experiment that if we end in global consensus to red, I get $1.50 for that experiment. And if we reach global consensus to blue, I only get 50 cents. And you would be told the opposite incentives. So of course, what everybody wants is to reach consensus to their preferred color, their higher payoff color, but it's simply not possible. We deliberately introduce the tension between the incentives and the experiment. And this is showing you one visualization of a finding that we, re we repeated very, very reliably and strikingly, which is where we took networks generated according to this preferential attachment model, where there are indeed these super connectors. Um, and what we did was, um, as I'm showing in the initial configuration here, um, we chose a small minority of that population to prefer red, to get a higher payoff to red. So in this particular case, there's six out of 36 vertices who have a higher payoff to red, and 30 out of 36 have a higher payoff to blue. But we deliberately chose the red vertices, the minority, to be the ones that were the super connectors. So we're trying in a very stylized setting to ask the question, can a small but well-connected minority in a social network systematically impose their will against a majority that prefers something else? And as you can see, the answer in this particular experiment where I'm showing you snapshots of the actual play at different moments in time is yes. And basically, this happened um, 20 out of 24 times that we ran this experiment. Okay, So it's a very, very strong finding. OK. so. Um, I know I'm running a bit short on time, but I'll, I'll let me make a few um, comments and, and make some um, um, sort of describe some learnings to you. I won't call these findings in the scientific sense, but um, I invite you to go look at the, the source papers behind these experiments, which are all very meticulous and follow very careful statistical methodology so that I can claim that things like the phenomena I just described to you are indeed statistically significant and reproducible. Um, so, um, so let, me, but let me just make a couple of overarching comments um, about these experiments. Um, so, so um, and some of them are, are have bullet points up here, and some of them don't. Um, on the one hand, um, and I'll relate this perhaps to some of the mathematicals we studied. So, 
there's a definite sense in which the experiments that I'm running are highly over-stylized, right? I'm taking the full range of human behavior, emotion, rationality, ir irrationality, and I'm forcing everybody into this little box where all you can do is pick a color for your vertex and see the colors of your neighbors, and I'm incenting you to behave in one way or another with financial reward, okay? Similarly, the mathematical models that I described to you before, you know, seem impoverished, right? I mean, even the more elaborate preferential attachment one, where statistical choices are being made locally to decide who connects to whom, um, you know, a typical reaction um, from people not in the field and often from people in the field is to say, well, but, you know, this isn't how people make friends. People make friends because they have interests and they share goals or background and beliefs or they have happen chance meetings, so on and so forth. And so you can ask, well, isn't this a great, um, sort of deficit of this field to be trying to explain these complicated, diverse phenomena with these simplified models and experiments. And I would actually argue sort of the opposite. I would argue that, um, and, and let me take this last finding that I mentioned as an example. So, you know, one reaction that I get sometimes to this claim that a well-connected minority can impose its will systematically on a majority is like, well, of course we know this from, let's say, conservative bloggers and, and many other um, sort of social network phenomena on the web or in the media, so on and so forth. And the thing I like to counter argue when somebody says, well, we kind of already knew this, why did you need to document this in an experiment, is that when you try to explain why that happens in the real world, the typical thing to do is to invoke, you know, rhetor rhetoric, passion, emotions, sort of the human aspects that bring the phenomenon out, right? And I think that there's virtue in showing that that complexity may not be necessary to explain such phenomena. Okay, so part of the goal of this field, I think, and one of its strengths so far, is in taking complicated macroscopic network structures that, again, in individual domains like um, the blogosphere, may have some rich humanistic explanation to them and saying, you know, you don't need that complexity to explain this phenomenon. It might be the truth, there might be something that it adds, but it could just be from sort of fairly purely connectivity, for pure connectivity reasons, and the simple dynamics of an underlying process that we would expect these things to happen. And, you know, I think in many ways that's good science in the sense that, you know, in the spirit of Occam's razor, we should never prefer a more complicated explanation for a phenomenon when there's a simpler one at hand, okay? Um, but one, one of the other things that I find striking about these experiments is that even though they're very minimalistic and stylized, lots of human behaviors are able to be expressed in them. So, for instance, I take away language in these experiments. The, the subjects are instructed to not try to communicate in any way except through the system. There's no chat channel. They can't talk. There are physical barriers preventing them from seeing the workstation of other subjects. And yet, it's one of the first things that happens, no matter what the experiment is, is that people try to reinvent language in some sense. They try to invent signaling methods. And so, in particular, if you go read the surveys that went along with the these social differentiation or coloring experiments, um, you'll, you'll both see in the data um, people attempting to signal to each other, and then you'll see in their self-reports um, the sort of elaborate signaling mechanisms that they had in mind. So some people flicker back and forth between two colors to get the attention of a neighbor that they think isn't attending to the game enough and should be changing their color, for instance. Other people reported flickering back and forth between two colors because given their current network configuration, they could actually safely play either of those colors. And they were trying to tell their neighbors that in case it's useful to you in your local neighborhood, I could be either red or blue, okay? Now, what says, so, I mean, that's a very, very subtle signaling, signaling mechanism. And what's it's fascinating to sort of peep, see people who've never played these games or anything like it before quickly invent the, or attempt to invent these kinds of languages. What's much harder to detect is whether anybody, any recipient of this signaling ever reacts to it in the intended way. And I haven't seen evidence of that. Um, but so let me just quickly mention a little bit about, you know, where this field is heading. Um, and and I'll, I'll focus on one aspect of it that I think is, is the subject of a lot of discussion and I think will be the subject of a lot of, I'm going to a conference at NYU over the next couple of days um, on all these topics and more. And it's clear that one of the themes at this conference will be um, the idea of essentially using the web as a platform for social, social science experiments on a large scale. 
So I've been doing experiments in a laboratory environment on a deliberately or necessarily modest scale. And, um, you know, there are trade-offs involved here. By doing things in that laboratory in setting, I sacrifice being able to do experiments that potentially could have thousands or hundreds of thousands or millions of participants, but I gain a great deal of control. Right? I know exactly what the subjects were doing. I know that they were attending to the task at hand. I don't have to worry about attrition, like somebody just dropping out of the game in the middle, and so on and so forth. But, but despite those trade-offs, and I think the virtues of, of doing laboratory experiments, I think it's inevitable that we're going to, you know, that there's a revolution that's coming in the social sciences and their interaction with computer science and, and other areas that I think is going to be both exciting and very healthy for both fields, which is to essentially use the web as a platform that you might think of as like a particle collider. It's like a raw platform in which we can do experiments on a scale that they've never been done before. And, you know, many of you might have seen vestiges or, or sort of attempts to do this in various ways already. Um, so, for instance, for those of you that are familiar with CAPTCHAs, CAPTCHAs are these little cognitive tasks that you're sometimes given in order to go uh, to get an account on Facebook, for instance, recognizing some difficult text, so on and so forth. You're essentially performing some kind of labor in order to verify that you are actually a human being. Um, if those of you that are not familiar with Amazon's kind of side project known as Mechanical Turk, it's basically a labor market. If you go there, you'll see... Um, people paying, say, five cents for each image that you will label as to its content. Like, is there a car in this image? Just sit there, and for each one of them you label, they'll give you five cents. And, of course, they want to get this data, so in order to build statistical models for detecting whether there's a car in the image or not. But, but that same platform, which is right now being used to essentially capture paid labor could instead be used for social science experiments, right? There's no reason I couldn't run the kind of game I'm running. I mean, conceptual reason. There are many technical difficulties. But there's no conceptual reason I couldn't run graph coloring experiments with thousands of participants or millions of participants on a service like that and have the sort of incentive conditions be largely reproduced. Okay. Um, and as a forward pointer, I'll, I'll mention that um, there's um, a good friend and colleague I have in this area named Duncan Watts, who some of you may have heard of, um, who will actually be giving a talk on October 15th in engineering that will be open to the public. And the title of his talk is, is basically Using the Web to Do Social Science. And um, I've seen the talk, and it's fascinating. So if you find this stuff interesting, I, I highly recommend his talk as well. And let me just finish by, by saying the obvious, which is um, even though there's a certain modesty, modesty and scale to these experiments, um, if you know a little bit of system design and computer science, um, you'll realize that these experiments are a phenomenal amount of work, both on the technical end and in the subject management and data analysis end. And I've been blessed with great colleagues and postdocs and graduate students. And here I'm just acknowledging the five people that were most centrally involved in the experiments I described today. So let me stop there and take questions.